Hi everyone, this is Ken at Master Isaac Steinkamp for ChessOpeningsExplained.com and I'm really excited to be back today for my second video on the site. Today's video, I'm going to share my first ever winning as a 2400 plus rated opponent in which I played the black side of the London system. The London system has a reputation for being dry, for not really offering either side much, and simply being you know, a really easy resource for white to play if he wants to draw. But in reality, when you look at the top players who are playing it, Magnus Carlsen, Vladimir Kromnik, American Grandmaster Gata Komsky, you'd start to think otherwise. With the London system being like a popular option for them in their opening repertoire, a lot of other players have started taking it on too. In fact, when I went over to Europe, to play for three months, the London system was my backup opening with white, and I scored extremely well with it. I would say probably about 75%. So that's just to give you an idea of how strong the London system can be if black is not prepared properly in the opening. Uh, white usually tries to find a really small advantage and continues to press and gets a really easy game without having to study that much theory. I'm really happy with the game that I'm about to share with you guys today because I found a line for black that poses a lot of problems for the London system, and if the white player is not prepared, it's white who's struggling to find the quality. So let's go ahead and get into it. So after d4, there's a variety of ways to get into the London system. I'm going to start with how you could get there through the chessopeningsexplained.com repertoire, because of course if you play the Nimzo Indian, you'll be playing knight f6, expecting this move c4, after which e6, bishop b4, and the usual style Nimzo Indian play. But okay, we're studying the London system, and white can play this trendy move, bishop to f4. Now, one of the main ideas of this bishop f4 move is by not committing this knight yet onto f3, we give ourselves an added way of playing for the center. So let's say if black is a King's Indian or Grinfeld player, after g6 he would run into a little bit of trouble after this move knight to c3. Should black play bishop to g7, white will play e4, and we have full control over the center, and black is going to have to settle for a kind of perk variation. Another idea is that should, you know, Black, play, uh, black try to play d5, we can play queen d2. And if black tries to get some sort of queenside counterplay going with c6, already this move f3 is quite strong with idiot e4. I want a really nice game in Austria here in this line for white. So this is the main idea with bishop to f4 against g6. Of course, we're not King's Indian players, you know, as chess openings explained to players, we're looking for standard Nimzo play. But if you're going to try to follow the dogmatic style of using the same move order, for the London system, you might not be happy with the position that you get after e6, e3, d5, knight d2, c5, c3, knight c6, knight f3, and this is a fairly standard position that you could reach in the London system. But the problem is pretty obvious. This bishop on c8 is never really going to be able to find daylight because of the e6 and d5 pawns. By being on the wrong side of the pawn chain, obviously if we were using very elementary terms of the word, this is a bad bishop on c8. So even though the position is considered relatively equal, thanks to black's ability to play for the center, it's really difficult sometimes to figure out what the right plan is with a c8 bishop. And I think when I look at a lot of London system games, this is exactly where black goes wrong. So even though this is a perfectly fine system for black to play, I would recommend the line that I played in the London as the black side of the London system in the game I'm about to show you. And you can reach that position by playing 2 to d5, transposing to my game. So my game actually started d4, d5. I was hoping for a queen's gambit declined or some sort of similar opening. But after bishop to f4, knight f6, we've reached exactly the same position. And after this telling move e3, alas, we've reached the London system. So I played c5, a key move for contesting the center. We're not really that worried about dc4. There's always queen a5 to pick up the pawn again, where we can simply move this e pawn and pick up the c5 pawn thanks to the f8 bishop. So after c3, cd4, ed4, we're going to reach a Carlsbad pawn structure in which white has you know, the pawn chain here and black will have a pawn chain here after playing a move e6 once I finish developing my bishop. So I played bishop to f5. Now my opponent put queen to b3, probably the most challenging move in the position, targeting b7, putting a little bit of pressure on d5. Now I had a game in Germany at the Bad Vorschwofen Open in, uh, last March where my opponent via transposition we reached this position. So knight d2, knight c6, knight gf3. And e6. We reached a position like this where white played bishop to e2, I played bishop to d6, and after trading off the dark squared bishops, black's plan really suggested itself. a6, b5, containing white's queen side and getting ready for the minority attack, and meanwhile white had to try to find ways to use this e5 square to his advantage, and it was very difficult after, you know, to play for this move knight to e5. So these positions, I would say, even though are roughly equal, are 
slightly more favorable from black because the plan is able to suggest itself. Um, so white obviously being 2400 and playing against you know some guy like me obviously wants a little bit more than a position where he's fighting for a draw. So he played this move queen to b3. Okay, well I played queen to c8. The idea simply being I'm supporting my b7 pawn and I'm getting ready to develop somewhat normally. For those of you guys who played the Karo Khan against 1e4, you guys could actually reach a very similar position in the exchange variation of the Karo Khan. So knight to d2, I played knight to c6, just developing my last knight, then gf3 and e6. So already we have a Carlsbad pawn structure where I have this you know pawn chain from f7 to d5, and white has this pawn chain from d4 to b2. Black's idea is usually a play for a minority attack, whereas white's idea is to play on the king side in the center through this e5 square. And that's one of the problems with this line, I think, for white, is that with this queen on b3, at some point white will have to waste some time to bring this queen back and engage on the king side. And that's a tempo that I'm hoping to exploit should white play a move like bishop to e2 or h3. The idea is simply that I'll play a move like h6 to make sure I can preserve this bishop in the case of a knight h4, and I'll play for bishop e7, castles, and my plan, again, fairly easily suggests itself, a6, b5. So this is a little bit too simple, I think, uh, for white to be allowing this, and that's why the main line in this position is to play knight to h4. White is trying to compensate by the placement of his b3 queen and um, not really knowing where this bishop on f1 should go by trying to win the bishop pair, creating an imbalance in the position where, for the time that it will take him to re-maneuver and find the best places for his pieces, at the very least, he is creating uh, a small you know, advantage with the bishop pair. So uh, instinct would be to play bishop to g6, but of course mainline is actually to play bishop to e4. And the idea is that I want to pro provoke f3, which is exactly what happens in the game, and the game is actually fairly instructive as to why f3 is not that great of a move. Um, of course the mainline continues knight takes e4, and there's two ways to continue here obviously, is there's two different captures, the first being knight takes e4. I think this is a great way for black to play for equality, but it's a little bit more difficult to play for anything more. I mean, keep in mind we have just given um, we have just given White the bishop pair, and you know our knight is on e4, but we need a little bit more than this. I think to be playing for more than just a draw, and that's why I'm going to recommend the move d takes e4. Already we can see that this knight is really without moves thanks to this e4 pawn, and that's why White must play this move g3. And after a move like bishop to e7, knight to g2, Black has a really nice plan of playing his knight to d5 and playing f5. In fact, Sergei Karyakin executed this exact plan against Georg Meyer in the recent Speed Chess Championships on chess.com. Um, so obviously, if Sergei Karyakin is playing it, uh, that's not exactly bad company to be with at all. So of course, my opponent played f3, the move that we're going to talk about in today's video. And after bishop g6, he happily grabbed the bishop pair, and we reached a nice position. This being a g60 game, we were both playing a little bit quickly, so bishop d3, bishop e7. I'll get back to this move in a second. Um, but we actually reached a critical position on the next move, where white played this move, a4. A move that seems really natural. White is going to try to stop the queenside expansion for black. Black's plan, obviously, before this move was to play a6 and b5 and try to get a nice position. But now we realize that after a move like a6, white is going to slowly put a lot of pressure on black, the idea being Maybe to play queen c2, b4, maybe you find a nice way to get this knight all the way to c5 through b3. White has a really nice clamp. This b7 pawn is going to be a long-term weakness. So if black plays really simple moves, he could very easily get into a slightly worse position. But one of the problems with a4 is that white still has yet to really figure out where is this king going. Of course, he could have castled on this move, which actually turns out to be the best move in the position. But now he has to constantly be worried about the pressure on h2. You know, black still has the same plan of playing a6 and b5. I think black has a fairly nice position, if, especially if we can trade off these dark squared bishops. Then I'll play queen to c7 and put even more pressure on h2. So this is already not such an easy decision to make, but in playing a4, if we're not going to castle kingside, we definitely can't keep the king in the center. So where is this king going? If it goes to the queen side as was snaring the game, it opens up white to a lot of tactical ideas. So in the game he played a4 and it's up to black right now to point out that white hasn't exactly finished his opening development. Uh, black's king is a little bit safer than white's so it's it's okay for black to be looking for something a little bit more dynamic. Uh, so let's see what you can find. I'd recommend that you pause your videos and try to find the best resource for black. 
Okay, well, if you haven't found the resource yet, I again would recommend that you pause the video. But the move that I found that guarantees black a significant advantage is this move knight to h5. And even though the rest of the game seems pretty simple, I think it all stems from this maneuver. Knight to h5, forcing move. White needs to play bishop to e3. And my next move was really nice, knight to g3. Of course, we have a pin here on the h file. And because white didn't connect his rooks by castling, he can't play this move hg3 because of rook takes h1 and will pick up the other rook as well. So rook to g1 is more or less forced. I played this move knight f5. Now, if I had had a little bit more time, I probably would have looked a little bit more into this move rook takes h2. What I didn't like about this on a g60 game was it just didn't feel practical to self-pin my pieces and allow this threat of knight to f1. This felt a little bit too much. So I play knight f5 because it forces white to give up the bishop pair. And without the bishop pair, it's not exactly clear what white has in the position. He can't castle kingside. By playing a4, he can't easily castle queenside, and this king is going to be a constant source of pain. Of course, should black, you know, white try to preserve the bishop pair, we're going to pick up this h2 pawn and have a fairly nice, stable advantage. So rook takes h2. Okay. So after knight to f5, white decided that it's time to give up the bishop pair. Bishop takes f5, g takes f5, h3, trying to solidify the pawn structure. Of course, the problem with this is that we've now created a whole bunch of dark squared weaknesses. So my next move was a really easy move to play, queen to c7. This is a really natural move because it prepares to connect the rooks, but it also targets this diagonal, either with the idea of going to g3 or even going to h2, really trying to poke around at some weaknesses here. White sensed the danger and immediately queenside castled. This might seem like a really bad move to play, but in fact the computer already suggested it as the best move for white. That's already how much danger white is in. Now, after f4, bishop f2, where if we recall, white played this move a4 to stop this move b5. Ironically, this move a4 now encourages this move b5. So I played this move a6 with the idea of playing b5. And my idea was simple. If white tries to create counterplay on the king side with this move g3, I'll simply take this pawn, thank you very much. And after g takes f4, g6, closing down the g file. If white tries to trade off rooks and go into this endgame, he'll quickly realize that he's worse. I'll simply make sure to not fall for this rook h8 skewer, and I'll have a long term target here on f4, in which my king side pawns should be enough to play for a win. I check this after the game with an engine, and of course, black has a slight advantage here. So. Instead, my opponent decided to play king b1, trying to get his king off the c file. There's some, there's some unpleasantries here, I guess. I guess the other thing he was worried about was that if um, g3 takes, if he were to play bishop takes, I could drop back my queen and I'd be threatening this move knight d4. Of course, white is already in more than enough trouble. So king b1 was played, and here, as I mentioned before, my plan was to play b5. Even though I'm sacrificing a pawn, I'm creating a half-open file directly on his king. So this move, b5, although an exclam, more or less suggests itself. So ab5, ab5, queen b5, and the game actually ends in just a couple of moves. I quickly castled kingside, the idea being that I'm bringing over the rook, making sure my opponent has no counterplay, and asking this king how he's doing. My opponent played queen to b3, I played rook on f to b8. Now it's worth mentioning that should white try to redirect his pieces to the kingside, he didn't have time. So if he plays queen to d3, I'm still playing rook to b8, and even after a move like g3, this attack is so slow. Meanwhile, I'm getting good moves like queen a5, and the game is already more or less over thanks to the weak king here on b1. So white played queen to b3, I played rook on f to b8, and here white realized that he has to move his queen once again. He played queen c2 really quickly, and to finish off the game, I made a move that made black, uh, white resign instantaneously, giving black a permanent advantage. Let's see if you guys can find it. Well, if you guys haven't found the move yet, in reality, a lot of things are winning here, like queen a5, queen a7, they should be able to convert to a win, but my next move forces a material win, and that's this move knight to b4. The idea is obviously that should white decide to take this knight, I'm going to play rook a1 check, king takes a1, I'm picking up the queen. It's not just the material I'm picking up, though, it's this mate threat. And once we realize that this mate threat is more or less unstoppable, it's time to resign. Of course, should white not take this knight and play a move like queen to c1, we're going to play this move knight to d2, knight to d3 rather, 
hitting the bishop, hitting the queen, and more importantly, hitting this b2 pawn. The same holds true if instead of taking the knight or playing queen c1, if we play queen to b3, this is a much more direct threat. Now white has to play queen to c2, and we can pick up this pawn here on b2 and win the game quite nicely. Once the position blows up, a mating that will be created between this queen, this rook, and this bishop, and white's position will fall apart. So this is a really nice game. When you think about the London system, you think about solid opening play and the ability to really um, press black. But in this game, it seemed anything but. I was able to create a nice position in which I was able to use central tension, C takes D, convert to a Karo Khan exchange variation, and maneuver to a really nice uh, victory here. Of course, I could have played knight h5 and move sooner, um, as you recall, after this move, uh, where is it? Bishop to d3. I can actually play this move knight h5, and again we would reach a similar position. Um, and this is a really critical idea I think on these lines because white actually doesn't have a good move if not for bishop to d3. So it's important to keep in mind when you're playing against a London system, you want to look for some dynamic resources as well. Usually when I think in terms of who plays the London system, it's I'm going to put my pieces here no matter what you do and I'm going to have a simple plan. But you can't really do that against this line of the London system. And that's why I think it's so great for black. Uh, I really enjoyed playing this game. I actually only used eight minutes on my clock, which was somewhat amazing considering I was playing a 2400 plus rated player. And white really struggled to find any sort of defensive resources at all this game. So this was a really fun win and I'm really happy to have shared it with you guys here on chessopeningsexplained.com. For more videos and really cool content, of course, you can become a member at chessopeningsexplained.com if you're not a member already. Um, for more great opening content by Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein. Until next time, this is Candidate Master Isaac Steinkamp signing off for chessopeningsexplained.com.